Hi, this is Ian Kerner. I'm a sex therapist and couples therapist, and you're listening to me on That's Total Mom Sense. As moms, we often wonder, am I doing enough for my kids? I'm here to tell you, you are super mama. That's because we have an undeniable superpower, our intuition, and it never steers us wrong. I call it our mom sense. Hi, I'm Kanika Chedda Gupta, and I'm the host of That's Total Mom Sense. I'm a journalist, entrepreneur, wife, and mom of three, twins plus one. Now, if I had a dollar every time I heard, gee, you have your hands full. On my podcast, I interview influential moms from various industries and cover topics that all first-time parents grapple with, from getting your baby to sleep to screen time allowance, your new normal in your marriage, and how to dedicate time to yourself. Learn and laugh along with that total mom sense. Isn't it ironic and kind of sad that having kids can wreak havoc on a marriage and your sex life? Today, get ready to get your mojo back and rekindle the spark with your spouse, thanks to renowned licensed psychotherapist and nationally recognized sex counselor, Ian Kerner. Ian Kerner, who is a PhD and LMFT, specializes in sex therapy, couples therapy, and working with individuals on a range of relational issues that often lead to distress. Ian is regularly quoted as an expert across all media outlets. He's been on NBC's The Today Show and is quoted in CNN Health, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Economist, and NPR. He gives lectures on sex and relationships with recent presentations at NYU, Yale, Princeton, the Ackerman Institute, and TED 2021. Ian is the New York Times bestselling author of She Comes First, published by HarperCollins, which has been translated into over a dozen languages. His new book, So Tell Me About the Last Time You Had Sex, was recently published by Hatchet. Ian lives in New York with his wife, two sons, and two dogs. He maintains a private practice in Manhattan dedicated to honoring the centrality of sexuality in his patients' lives. Ian, welcome to That's Total Mom Sense. Hi, Kanika. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. I think that my listeners are waiting with bated breath to hear what you have to say. I'm pretty conservative, and there's going to be moments where I start to blush as we uh, unpack all of the topics we have at hand, including your latest book. To start, though, I want to give your sister-in-law and our and my friend, um, Leslie Rubish, some love. Hi, Leslie. Thank you again for connecting both of us. And Kanika, I want to ask you at the end of the show if I made you blush, because I, I have a lot of different couples, many of whom would define themselves in, as conservative, and I think I have a... An easygoing way of talking about sex, but you tell me at the end if okay. I will or cringe in any way. <laughs> right, I'm taking you up on that. I will. Well, I always start by asking my guests about their childhood, and you know, I'm so curious. Did you always know you were going to go into this line of work and become a sex therapist? Absolutely not. Um, I don't think I grew up thinking I was going to be any kind of therapist. But uh, at a certain point, as I was becoming sexual and wanting to date, um, wanting to be sexual, I had a lot of questions. And I grew up in a time where we didn't have the internet, we didn't have a ton of magazines or, or resources that were an easy way to get tips. And so I really struggled with aspects of sex. And I felt you know, very alone and and isolated and that there was so much inside of me and yet I felt like such a a sexual and an erotic person, um, but I didn't really know how to how to actualize that. So um, it was later in life when I had a chance to kind of change careers that um, I, I came to this line of work and it was largely based on experiences in talking about sexuality with other therapists that were very inspiring and important to me. That's wonderful. What are some life lessons that shaped you during that time into the individual you are today? Well, it's interesting, Kanika. I have a 107-year-old grandmother who just died last week, and uh, she lived a long life. And, um, you know, I grew up with a lot of chaos. My parents were very young, and they split up early, and my dad was an artist and really thought about himself. 
And my grandmother really stepped in and was kind of a, both a maternal and a paternal figure. So it's interesting because my dad himself was an artist and my grandmother and my mother were very, um, I would say conservative and very structured. And I think I grew up with a combination of both, a real appreciation of following your bliss and valuing your freedom and especially valuing creativity as a force. And I actually think of Eros, the original definition of Eros is actually life force. So I think of even sexuality as part of that life force. Mm -hmm. But I also think I have a really conservative side of me, too, that's very routine driven, that's very structured, that worries about a lot of the things that my father never worried about. So it's kind of like um, like, like a working creativity that I kind of ended up with. So in your first book that you wrote over 20 years ago called She Comes mm -hmm. First, The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman, you essentially gave men a roadmap to the G-spot and beyond. And uh, Cosmopolitan says, uh, and I quote, this is every man's must read. Tell your guy to put the remote down and pick up She Comes First. In a nutshell, what are some of the high level examples that you can share that you find that are still relevant? Because I know in an interview you've said that there's certain things that you recant. So what do you find relevant from that book today? Well, let's see if I make you blush, because the biggest thing I found is that our society as a whole, and particularly men, are ill-cliterate. There yes. is a plague of ill-cliteracy, and I think that the big message of the book uh, was helping to give men, as, as well as women, uh, an accurate framework for thinking about female sexuality and creating sexual experiences that are mutually pleasurable. Because not only do we have a deficit of sex often happening, especially for parents, we have a deficit of quality sex happening. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because we're stuck in a kind of a what I call the intercourse discourse, just a, a way of valuing intercourse above all other behaviors and approaching sex. But, you know, when you look anatomically, the clitoris is actually a few, inch, a few centimeters above the vaginal entrance. What that means is that so many intercourse positions fail to uh, adequately stimulate the clitoris. And really, the clitoris, it's, it's fully known, is the powerhouse of female sexuality. Once you go two or three inches inside the vaginal canal, there are few, if any, really active nerve fibers because think about it, the vaginal canal is designed to deliver babies, right? And we right. wanna minimize feeling and minimize sensitivity, minimize pain. So really, uh, it's all about those clitoral structures that are on the surface of the vulva and within the first inch or so of the vaginal canal. So it's important to move from an intercourse way of thinking to an outer course way of thinking, which is actually the way that most LGBTQ and queer folk think about sexuality. They're not defined by one way of approaching sex. They build sex scripts and sex menus out of many different behaviors that are personalized for their pleasure. Right, right. In uh, your next book you came out with called He Comes Next, The Thinking Woman's Guide to Pleasuring a Man. And then there was also Passionista, The Empowered Woman's Guide to Pleasuring a Man. You cover every angle of male sexuality now, and you provide answers to women's burning questions. So give us a few, I wrote mind blowing, pun intended, tips. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, you know, first of all, He Comes Next and Passionista are the same book. Passionista was okay. just a paper paperback version of He Comes Next. Okay. It's good for me to say that out loud because people sometimes get confused and say, where can I get a copy of He Comes Next or why is it so expensive on, on Amazon? Interesting. Um, okay. You know, Thanks. I don't know, you know, you're asking me for a mind-blowing tip, and I, I don't know that I, I can get into a mind-blowing tip mood exactly, but I will say that I wrote that book to actually just debunk a lot of expectations that, that women had around men and that uh, men are always high desire, men can be walking erections, men are totally genitally focused, men are intercourse focused. I mean, I think I just wanted to sort of break out of some of those um, you know, way, ways of thinking, to be honest. But men are, you've said, light switches 
where they can be turned on and off, and women are more like dimmers. That is important. Um, and again, that's that's a generalization. That's not true of, of, of everyone. But in general, men experience what we would call spontaneous desire or highly reactive desire. And this can be a problem in, in marriages because men can really sometimes process a single sexual cue. Like, look, I'm a guy. My wife comes out of the shower. I'm still attracted to her. She looks cute. She looks sexy. Like, I feel that in my body. And, that, and I feel that in a way that I want to be sexual. Now, listen, I could get out of the shower. I don't know if my wife finds me sexy when I get out of the shower, but let's say she does. That single sexual cue doesn't metabolize into arousal in the same way. So women are more in what we would call a responsive desire model, meaning that Desire isn't the first thing you feel. It's like the second or third or fourth, and there needs to be a percolation and a simmering of sexual cues. So that's where we start, kind of get into the, the light switch, like quickly on and the dimmer, which is a little slowly. And basically what I'm saying is there's two different desire frameworks that often clash in a relationship, and we want to kind of create a shared framework. We all know 50% of the marriages in the U.S., sadly, and in divorce, and there has been an uptick of divorce rates during the pandemic. So do you think that it's, of course, the stress, the burnout, also the lack of sex, because that's how these partners have drifted? Yeah, I think it's two things related to sex. I think one, it, it is the lack of sex because sex is something that's so important and so central and something that we can really miss. And it's the thing that makes us more than just roommates. It's the thing that uh, defines us as as romantic partners. And so we can miss the sex. We can miss the romance. But here's the other thing that doesn't, that doesn't always get discussed is that, you know, there was research that showed that couples who had sex once a week, good, healthy sex, had higher levels overall of relationship positivity than couples who didn't have sex once a week. And the couples who had sex more than that, three, four, two, five times a week, they didn't have higher levels of relationship positivity than the couples who had sex once a week. But the couples who had sex less than once a week had lower levels of relationship positivity. So it's not just that we miss sex for sex. It's that sex is a powerful, positive force in our relationship. It reinforces and strengthens a relationship. And so without it, a relationship is weaker and vulnerable overall, not just in intimacy, in every area. Mm, yeah. I mean, one thing that I want to kind of say and reveal is that, you know, I'm a part of many mom groups and we all share openly with each other. And I know a lot of moms after they have kids easily go six months, nine months, a year, two years without having sex. Mm -hmm. Is that like code red? Well, you know, having a baby uh, is, is a beautiful milestone in the life cycle of a couple, and it really helps continue the story of a couple. And it's important that couples have stories and keep expanding. But you're right, um, it can really lead to sort of a, a temporary cessation in, in sexuality. And I think couples need to plan on sort of how to deal with that period and how to, and so it means A, being able to communicate. The problem is when you don't find yourself getting back into a sexual or a romantic routine and that period after having a baby of six, eight, ten weeks where sex is, is a little more fraught where you don't end up picking it back up and uh, it is easy to lose your sense of sexuality and it's easy to lose your sense of eroticism and I think after having a baby both men and women are, are vulnerable in, in many different ways to that loss of sort of that uh, sexual connection. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, and then the babies grow up and then they become toddlers and kids, God bless them, but they, you know, are definitely a reason for losing the intimacy in a marriage and sex in a marriage. So, you know, how do we navigate being parents of young kids and making time? 
couples are good at multitasking, right? We're good at being parents. We're good at changing diapers. Then we're good about talking about bills. We're good at talking shopping. We're good about solving our work problems. We're good at multitasking. But when does sex come into that sort of multitasking, right? So I always talk to couple to couples. I say it's not just about scheduling sex or scheduling a date night. It's about maintaining an erotic thread in your relationship. It's about keeping the air oxygenated with a little bit of eroticism. It's about being able to just have an erotic moment or a sexual moment and then continue. You know, if it, you're not going to end up in bed having sex if there isn't anything leading up to that that is mm. erotic or sexy. I think it's less about let's schedule sex, although I believe in scheduling sex, to be honest, um, but it's more about committing to... Um, being flirty, being erotic, uh, being sexy with each other, decoupling a sexual gesture from an obligation to have sex, right? So many people, so many couples won't even touch each other or hold hands or kiss or grab or grope or say something sexy because they think, oh my God, does this mean I'm, if I engage, I have to go have sex, I have to run in the bedroom? So decoupling sexiness and eroticism from actually having sex is important. You explained that there are two types of marriages. There's traditional and egalitarian. So can you kind of explain what that means? I think what I see in my practice, sometimes most couples come in um, and they're, they're in egalitarian relationships, meaning like, there's a stay-at-home dad or sometimes it's a stay-at-home mom and they're sharing shopping lists and they're sharing duties and it's like each playing to each other's strengths and there aren't predictable gender roles. That's interesting. That kind of a relationship, which is the kind of relationship so many of us are in, actually can create sexual issues when you want to sort of... Um, step into something that might feel a little gendered from a sexual perspective. On the other hand, sometimes, uh, rarely less so, especially in New York, am I, do I see couples who I would say subscribe to more traditional roles in which um, men are out there working and bringing home the bacon and women are at home with kids, you know, cooking it up. But I guess that would sort of be the difference between traditional and egalitarian. And I think many of us have aspects of, of both. Counterintuitively or paradoxically, I found that sometimes it's really the couples in traditional marriages who have more resilient sex lives than the couples who are in egalitarian relationships. So it's, it's interesting. Did you know there's an organizing app designed just for families? Named a must-have mobile app on the Today Show, Cozy is an app to help families who are juggling school schedules, practices, meetings, doctor's appointments, and even helps them schedule a workout or a date night. Here's how it works. Cozy tracks everyone's schedules and events in one place with a shared color-coded calendar. Cozy even reminds others about events so you don't have to. No more missed pickups or double bookings. It's easy to get started. You can even pull in events from your family's personal work and school calendars. Cozy helps with other things on your plate too. The shared grocery list lets the whole family add items in real time, and you'll never find yourself at the store without the list. It's always on your phone and up to date. If you need help figuring out dinner, there's even a place to store recipes and plan meals ahead. The best part, it's free. Just download Cozy Family Organizer from the App Store, and that's spelled C-O-Z-I, and get the free app today. You all know I love being organized, using calendars to sync up and labels so you never drop the ball. Cozy up with Cozy to keep you and your family on track. So in your latest book, so tell me about the last time you had sex, laying bare and learning to repair our love lives. You shed light on your philosophy of how sex is like a story and there's a script. So tell me about the last time you had sex is a question that I ask all of my patients, all of the couples I see who, who come in with uh, sexual problems. And in a sexual, a single sexual event, it's rich and deep with content and the way people are turned on or turned off, the things they like, the things they don't, the, the, the ways they talk about sex. And there is a 
it is an event. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. And in talking to couples about that, you get a sense of what their baseline sex script is, because most of us in long-term relationships tend to have sex pretty much, uh, we tend to replicate it, you know, w what works or even, unfortunately, what doesn't work. So I really try and deconstruct a sexual event into a sex script and then really work with couples and help them rewrite that sex script or amplify that sex script in ways that are really um, pleasurable and expansive. And so that's what I do in my practice. And I do that over the course of sessions every other week. And so the book is really as if as close to sitting with me and uh, rewriting your sex script to work for both of you as a couple. Yeah, no, that's great. And I do think it's important to have it be part of routine. You kind of say that spontaneity is out and it's it's all about scheduling. So I think that's important. But um, what are some other kind of pointers you have for couples, especially those with kids, on how to rewrite that script and, and mm -hmm. do something new? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it's funny, this is, I have a TED talk coming up and, and this is the thing, you know, you work with TED on what are you going to talk about and you figure out what's going to be, you know, most relevant. And what they wanted me to focus on was this idea that couples don't have enough psychological arousal in their relationships, right? They're dependent on kind of a, a script of uh, physical behaviors. And yet when we're on our own, if we're fantasizing, if we're self-pleasuring, we could, we could really engage our imaginations in ways that are very arousing. There are women who can fantasize their way to orgasms. Men can become very aroused without even touching themselves. So that's all psychological arousal. So why aren't we playing in that space more with each other? So I think mm. really starting to introduce that kind of mind-based psychological playful arousal into a relationship is key. Okay, so here's a, uh, you know, interesting question. I feel like all women are thinking about it. Should women fake it? No, quite simply, no. Uh, from the very first date to being in a long-term relationship, you want to be able to honestly communicate and you want to be able to give feedback. And uh, anytime you fake it, uh, A, you're subordinating your pleasure, but you're losing a, losing a, an opportunity to communicate. And we have to sort of be a little more resilient about having these conversations. I mean, we can have tough conversations with anybody. Why do we have to be so delicate when it comes to sex to the point where we would fake it and not even talk about what's working? And why would we assume that, that sex would automatically work without talking about it. Yeah. You know? um, so no, I, I don't believe in faking anything, nor do I believe that orgasm has to be the most important part of sex. So if you're faking orgasm, you're also faking probably everything that's leading up to orgasm. Ah, uh, yeah. To orgasm. So no, 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 don't fake it. Figure out how to talk about it. So now let's talk about, you know, getting creative when you have kids. Number one, how do we get them out of the bedroom and not come in? <laughs> let, me, let me just say something. I, I agree. Certainly, I don't want kids in the bedroom. And, and I think I can say that my kids have uh, never burst through the door when I was having sex. But I, I just want to say something, which is there is no study that shows that actually seeing your parents have sex is psychologically damaging. There are studies. <laughs> studies, however, that show that being sex avoidant as a parent, not talking about sex, not modeling intimacy, not uh, being affectionate does have a negative effect. Mm, yeah. So um, yes, it's about how to keep kids out of the bedroom, but not keep them out of a world of sexuality and learning and, and, and seeing that you are loving parents who are sexual. I don't have a lock on my door. I think every couple is going to be different in how they live in their routines and schedules. Kanika, what I'm used to, I give sex homework to couples, parents, and, and most couples will come back and, and say they tried it. 
But a lot of couples will say, oh, we just didn't get to it. We were sick. We had to work. We were tired. Our mother-in-law was here. Our kids were here. There's always going to be an excuse mm -hmm. to not have sex. There's always yeah. going to be a reason. And unless you start figuring out how to find those spaces, you're going to be in a tough spot. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that the kind of challenges um, that your patients come to you with are different when it's hetero couples versus same sex? Like what are some of their problems that they're facing oftentimes? I think people are more similar than different. So um, the reason my methodology, so tell, tell me about the last time you had sex works is because it really plays on the universal similarities between people while respecting individual differences. So I can be working with two dads and they're going through the same thing as a heterosexual couple or mm -hmm. two moms, you know? So I think the, the, the stressors that we deal with are different. What I will say is great about LGBTQ couples is they are more flexible about how they define sex. Um, they don't feel that sex has to look a certain way. And so there's, there's more ways of experiencing pleasure together. Yeah. Wow. You mentioned ethical porn earlier. Where do you find ethical porn and how, how would you get it so that your uh, laptop doesn't crash? Porn is a big part of life. Men love porn. More and more women are loving porn. It's a way of getting aroused together, just like you could read an ero erotic literature or watch Sex Life together. So I think we have to normalize porn and remove some of the stigma, but we also have to look for ethical porn. You know, just as you might drink a cup of fair trade coffee, you want to know, like, the people who are being treated well who are making this. And, and generally with ethical porn, um, you're pretty much assured that the actors are being treated well, that everyone's consenting, that everyone is of age, that everything's sort of working. I can't, I can't say that it's perfect, but it's, it's certainly better than just the unregulated world of, say, Pornhub or something like that. And so fortunately, the ethical porn movement is actually being led by women. So if you just look up like someone like Erica Lust, she is a mom, she is a, an erotic film maker, she's an, a sex educator, and, and she's making terrific ethical porn films. And, and, and there's enough happening now that's female-centric, that couple-centric, and the media has really caught on. So just, just Google it. I mean, you'll be sent to legitimate sources. Um, even the New York Times, Mary Claire, Cosmo, whatever it is, Bustle, whatever you're reading, there are reviews now of sort of like ethical porn sites. Um, so it's not hard to find. Just go Google ethical porn and you'll find a trusted reading media source that, that's probably talking about it. Good to know. So you have two sons and adolescent sons at that end. Do they have an understanding of what you do? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, I think they're often uh, a little embarrassed by it, uh, or they were when they were kids. But um, uh, I, you know, I guess based on what I do, there's a lot of books around. Um, I have a, a funny story, if I can just say. Yes, please do. <laughs> when I was, when one, my older son was like two years old, I was given um, a very elaborate vulva puppet. They're like, they look like like Muppets almost, and they're big, and they're adorned with jewels, and people use them for education, and they, they cost hundreds of dollars, and, uh, you know, I don't really know what to do with it. I'm not going to put it on, on my wall or anything like that. Um, so somehow my dog started using this uh, vulva puppet as like a toy, and you would play tug of war with the vulva puppet. Sometimes the dog, and the dog's name was Houdini, and sometimes Houdini, a uh, guest would come, and just like dogs bring you things, my dog now brings me sneakers, this dog would bring you this vulva puppet that was like bitten up and ravaged and tattered, it was like a, a tattered vagina, and it would just be <laughs> sitting on your lap covered in slobber, and you'd be like, what just happened, what, what's on me right now? And my younger son would say, that's Houdini's vagina, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's wonderful. So, oh, so you, you taught them even at the age of two that this is a vagina that's a penis. I didn't explicitly teach them. I think that they just picked up what was important to them at the time or what they could relate to and asked questions as they 
go along. Certainly at our dinner table, though, we talk a lot about sometimes like cisgender versus trans and, uh, you know, I mean, those concepts come up and uh, my kids are know that they're in an extremely sex positive home. You know, it's not sex excessive, but it's 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 sex positive. And uh, there's a lot that they won't ask me just because I'm their dad. Um, but um, I, I think that um, there's a, a healthy modeling of sex and it's certainly not out of the home. Yes, yes. I mean, for parents who are listening, who, you know, we're not as knowledgeable as you and we're not in the field, but we are going to have the sex talk someday. So when do you think is an appropriate time to do it and how should we go about it? I think the sex talk, look, sex occurs over the life cycle. We know that children experience a version of sexuality from birth and we know that people 100 and older experience sex. So uh, it's not about one conversation. It's about an openness and always being able to have the conversation and, you know, being able to walk past a, a Calvin Klein billboard and your comments on someone's boobs or bulge and being able to to talk about that in a way that's real to you, whether you want to say that's not an, a really an accurate depiction of uh how women or men look, or if you want to say, yeah, that's kind of a uh, sexy, they're trying to, you know, attract. I mean, there's there's going to be prompts all the time, you know, for sexual conversations and engage in them. And, you know, you might not have the answer to a question and that's okay. It doesn't mean don't have the conversation, just go help them find the answer. And then you, you can further explain that that's how babies are born. Right. What you don't want to do is create a sense of sexual shame. And okay. And sexual shame is so prevalent, mainly because it's considered even health, just healthy sexuality is considered taboo. And so many of us grow up with um, a sense of shame around sex. And uh, that's unfortunate. You've done many interviews and talks. Is there a question that you just all the time and you hate? Not I. How many times a week should a couple be having sex? Um, when I ask questions, like I was just talking to an insurance company, I was like, well, how much do you think I could actually get back on this? And they're like, well, everything's done. I said, just give me, give me a number. number. Yes. Okay. So I think I would, if I have to give a number, I would go back to that study that points to couples that have sex once a week tend to be in um, more positive relationships. And I know for parents, even once a week can be a real challenge. But the thing is, once you're not ha once one week becomes two weeks, it's pretty easy for it to become three weeks. And then you start to feel like, uh, I'm tired and, and you lose the sexual thread and then you have it. And if you have a partner you love and you're having good sex, you're like, hey, that was pretty good. I should be doing that more often. So yeah. you want to keep your sexual self in your life. Right. Right. Agreed. So was there a moment in time that you remember that you just used your dad sense and you knew exactly what your sons yeah. needed? Yeah, you know, um, there was, when they were much younger, and my wife um, directs TV commercials, and we used to travel as a family, and uh, so we'd all be on an airplane, and sometimes you'd hit turbulence, and I think at one time we hit a very rough patch of turbulence, and it was really scary. Like, I get scared. I feel my heart rate rise, and my wife gets very, very scared, and it's very easy to communicate that fear to kids, and... Uh, Rather than do that, I just sort of pretended we were on a fun amusement park ride and uh, made it really, uh, try and make it really fun and exciting. And so they had smiles on their faces like the whole time while my wife was like, you know, shaking and I was shaking inside. So I, I guess that's an example of using some dad sense. Yes. Oh, I love that. And I think, you know, we can all kind of use that when, when we're traveling with our kids. Is there a quote that you live by? There is, by Alfred Kinsey, I just, it's funny, I was just talking about it today. We are the recorders and the reporters of facts, not the judges of behaviors. And I didn't get it exactly right, but basically, as a, as a, especially as a sex therapist, I have to be very non-judgmental. And so it means just being open-minded and um, listening and being curious 
and not judging. Being, it's so important with sex, but, but in any conversation that we're having today. So I, I think for me, trying to always stay in a, in a non-judgmental place is, is important. It's now time for Mom Hall, when we share products we love. Is there a product that you're loving right now? I've been having fun with an app called Coral. I actually know the people behind it and I've contributed to it, but it's it's sort of taking sex education and sexual connection into the world of social media and they put a lot of uh, positivity into it. So I really like the uh, Coral app. I'm, I'm a fan of the WeVibe vibrator simply because it's designed for couples to use together. So as opposed to it being something that's designed just for women, say it's a chance for couples to, to kind of explore that together. Lastly, where can my listeners find you? Just on my website, iankerner.com. That's sort of uh, where I'm at. And your uh, books. What about your books? I hope that they're everywhere. I mean, <laughs> certainly they're on Amazon. But I think, you know, even if there's a book I'm anxious to read, I'll still order it from my indie bookstore. And it might take three or four days, but I really want to support indie bookstores. So I don't know if they all will have my books, but uh, they can all certainly get them very quickly. Well, thank you. Yep. Here it is right here. It was such a fun read. My husband's going to read it next. <laughs> and it's going to be, it's great for for couples to open up their minds and understand where the other is coming from. You know, create a script together and have fun with it. Well, this was a pleasure. You had a lot of great, compelling questions and you did a lot of research. And I really, I always appreciate a, a fun and good interview. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I promised Ian I would let him know if I blushed or not, and I did a couple times, but it was really a wonderful conversation. I'm so glad that we were able to dive right in and uncover all the myths and the questions that we all have when it comes to relationships and, and intimacy. I hope you got some great takeaways too. And if you enjoyed the episode, share it with your friends wherever you listen. The podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pod, Stitcher, really any platform that exists. And if you enjoyed it, please rate and review the episode. It really helps. If you have any suggestions for show topics or guests, or just want to say hi, email me at that's total mom sense at gmail.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at Kanika Chadda Gupta and on Twitter at Kanika Chadda. Thanks so much for being part of my tribe. Remember, always trust your mom sense and your dad sense. Stay strong, super parents. See you next time. Total mom sense.